folks, welcome to another episode of Cosmos with Cosmos. I'm Brandon. I'm Carolyn. <laughs> Carolyn? Carolyn? Who else is with us? Who else is with us? Oh, just Mike? Okay. <laughs> and today we are talking about William and Caroline Herschel, Woo-hoo! my favorite astronomers of all time, and I've been waiting for this episode for years. Five oh, seasons. Yeah. Five like, like, seasons every year. waiting for this. Why Once every month we it? talk about it, and then... What? Oh, yeah, why did Brandon, we not because do Brandon it? Because this to be took available. a chunk, yeah, and it took like a chunk of my soul out making this thing. Yeah. <laughs> what what an outline we got, those guys. Oh, <laughs> yeah, yes. yeah. So we we, we got the, the show ahead. So we're gonna get right into the drinks right now. So uh, Mike, what are you drinking today? Uh, the Georgian Star. Hey. Oh, okay. Uh, and it even sort of it's a little darker green than I, I wanted. It's close. Yeah, yeah but it's, it's a... um, it has coconut rum. Vodka, uh, pineapple juice, and blue curacao in it. And to Ooh. find out what the Georgian star is in this episode. And it's close to your in this color, too. <laughs> yeah, no. that's that's what I was going for. I mean, I have yeah. another one. It's this. Oh, okay. Which is uh, more of a Ooh, Neptune. That's a Neptune. That's definitely, definitely a Neptune. Yeah. That's Neptune. Carolyn, what you got? Uh, I'm drinking the August 1st, 1786. Because Very this good was a, year. a pivotal day in my Most history. I am. <laughs> We're not in the rules you yet. Haven't done so rules yet. Have to drink yet. Nope, you haven't done a rule uh, yet. And this is rye, simple syrup. That's it. And that's it. Oh, very minimalist. Uh huh. It is the drink Excellent. of August first. It is the drink. Of August. Oh. In, in a book, in a book that I got for Christmas, it is the drink of August first. It's like the the dog days drink. Yeah, it's 365 days, basically a drink. So how is it? It reminds me of cold. German nights when my in my youth where I grew up before I moved to England and got this oh. accent. So it keeps Excellent. me warm in my in my bones. Well done. Well done. <laughs> I'm so excited. I am drinking the Revolutionized Sky, uh, which is bourbon, mezcal, uh, bitters, bit of orange, and a cinnamon stick. It's that was on fire. Yeah, so you like the cinnamon stick on fire, get it nice and going like a birthday candle, and then dunk it into the drink. It's excellent. Ooh, so fancy these drinks yeah. nowadays. We don't have mezcal to make that drink, though. No, I don't like mezcal. Uh, it's it's just the right amount of smoke. In any case, <laughs> um, please follow us on all the things, Twitter, Drinking Cosmos, Insta, Cosmos with Cosmos. You can rate us, follow us on the iTunes, Spotify, wherever you get your podcasts. Um, and don't forget to join us after this episode in 16 years for The Hangover. It's going to be great. <laughs> <Woo>! <laughs> yeah, will we make it to The Hangover? Uh, and not. of course, <laughs> we have some great people listening now and later on in the podcast, including uh, Katie, which you can find her wonderful stuff on Wild Ixia on Etsy. Uh, Ron for the MrProctorShow.com, he of our Hangover intro music. And Jack. Yeah, so if you happen to be up there in the Council Bluffs area in Iowa, go check out the best planetarium Council Bluffs Iowa has to offer at rollingbluffsplanetarium.com. Endorsed wow. by me, Carolyn Herschel. Oh, you heard it here first. The first planetarium Carolyn Herschel has actually uh, promoted. <laughs> Speaking of promoting, uh, check out the shop. It will five, ten minute snippets of great topics. The opposite of what this episode will be. Yeah. <laughs> All right, so we have some rules before the episode begins. Um, anytime you hear a puppy bark, take yourself a drink. Any Star Wars reference or Lord of the Rings reference, take a drink. Um, I'm not sure how many references we're going to fit in today because it's just we so had three exciting. We already Lord of the Rings references, basically. Got it out of our system early. <laughs> All right, so for this episode, what we're doing is we're doing a bit of bio- biographical sketches, a bit of history, and a bit of um, acting as well. <laughs> so we have... <laughs> We have Caroline in here. She, uh, she'll be reading quotes Hello. from Caroline Herschel. Because... Hello! Hello! Because <laughs> uh, Caroline and William, they actually took prodigious notes in journals, so there's plenty of stuff to drudge from and, you know, have fun with. So yes. the quotes they read would be the things they actually wrote down, which is great. And Mike will be playing today, of course, Sir William Herschel. Oh, hello, darling! <laughs> Hello. It's been so long since we've seen each other. Since <laughs> we've been dead for quite a long time. <laughs> moldy. Moldy. All right. So I'm going to, to I'm going to take a drink before I get into this. All right. Let's <laughs> take a little. Did you memorize all your lines? 
I've looked at the first word of the first <laughs> section. <laughs> okay, so William and Caroline Herschel. Um, I, I kind of wanted to start it with one of our favorite facts we say on the show, um, which is there is a moment during a discovery that one person or two people will know for the first time that no one else in history has ever known. So there's that moment of like the pale blue dot, for example, looking at that, wiping it off, realizing it's Earth. There's Newton with you know, gravities, Einstein with all his relativity. So many amazing discoveries uh, where that one person in the history of forever is the only one to know that. And William and Caroline Herschel had that experience every single night. But all the amount of things they discovered, everything they discovered was the first time somebody put eyes on it or realized that. In it. Uh, so these are my favorite astronomers. And I'm very excited. So quick lightning facts. Um, so in case you do miss out on the next very long while. Um, <laughs> if you don't want to watch the rest of the video. <laughs> so they figured out the direction of flow of stars, meaning how the sun moves relative to the other stars, uh, discovered infrared, discovered Uranus, discovered so many moons, coined the term asteroid, discovered hundreds of nebulae, actually about 3,000 nebulae and objects altogether, uh, pioneered the improvement of telescopes. He was the greatest telescope maker in the absolute world. Uh, introduced the method of sweeps for observations, which we still use today. Uh, was an accomplished composer, concerts, music lessons. He was like the original Brian May, basically. Uh, their grandfather was also a hobbit, which is great. And then oh, Caroline. <laughs> I'm not going to count that as a reference just yet. And then Caroline was the first uh, woman to earn the stipend from the Royal Society for Science. The first woman to get paid for science. Excellent. <sighs> Uh, she, just in her own right, discovered eight comets, a number of nebulae, categorized the uh, general catalog, which we'll get into that later. Uh, she won awards left and right that no one's ever won before and just created impeccable notes for the entire, entire sky. Uh, so really, if like Copernicus, and Galileo, and Kepler, if they open the door for astronomy, the Herschels blew the whole damn thing open and just invented modern astronomy. That's our show. Thanks for joining this us. Is, there it this is. is. This is all things you can get done without television. <laughs> yeah. Or what looking at screens. You do? <laughs> well, and it's tough to have television because you need your remote, which runs off infrared, which Herschel discovered. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> all right. Well, then he has no excuse. He should have made a, tel uh, a TV right after that. No excuse. <laughs> <laughs> we'll talk about John Herschel later on. That's relevance. So in any case, let's get going to the beginning. 1738. Um, so William's about 12 years older, uh, 7 to 12 years older than Caroline, I believe. And one of the things I think is important to note, yeah, it makes sense. One of the things <laughs> I think is important to note about Caroline is her stature and apparently physical appearance as well. So she stood less than five feet tall. And if we look at her dresses and things like that, they measure them to about four foot three. So I she was very, very tiny. Tiny. Your height. And, I was thanks, <laughs> and that was thanks to typhus as a child. Oh. And then she had so many scars from smallpox as well uh, that her father said she would die a poor, solitary maid. Wow. So she kind of had that psyche ready to go in the back of her mind. Right, man. <laughs> uh, but, so he sounds kind of like an asshole, the dad does, Isaac. A little Herschel. bit, a little bit. Uh, but... But by all accounts, even in his her journals, he was just a great guy. As a matter of fact, Caroline remarks in her journal about conversations uh, hearing from the main room of the house between them and the father. Um, Caroline said, Liz. Often, I would keep myself awake that I might listen to their animating remarks, for it made me so happy to see them so happy. But generally, their conversation would branch out on philosophical subjects when my brother William and my father often argued with such warmth that my mother's interference became necessary. When the names Leibniz, Newton, and Euler sounded rather too loud for the repose of her little ones, who ought to be in school by seven in the morning, but it seems that on the brothers retiring to their own room where they shared the same bed, my brother William had still a great deal to say. And frequently <laughs> it happened that when stopped for an assent or reply, he found his hearer was gone to sleep. And I suppose oh. it was not till then that he bethought himself to do the same. Mike, what are your thoughts there? <laughs> I love the in and out of the pretty accent. <laughs> I'm sorry. I think I held that the entire time. You did. You did. And I didn't get to cook me with it, which is what I want to do. <laughs> Okay, but I, I love that passage by Caroline just about the warmth and how happy she was that other people were happy. 
Uh, that kind of describes her character throughout her life. She cares so much for William uh, that she just wants him to be happy and will do literally anything to make that so. Um, we'll see that later on, too. Uh, and so that, that family just came from like a jovial livelihood between the father. The mother was a different story. We'll talk about that. Uh, the grandfather, for example, we said was a hobbit. Abraham Herschel was a, he was a poor man, but he was a gardener. And then he turned into a brewer. And then he turned to a musician and the gardener again. <laughs> and, and his name is not Sam. Abraham, alas. <laughs> oh, there we go. Yeah, okay. <laughs> oh, I guess I have to drink, not just push the button. <laughs> And so that was Abraham, the grandfather. The father, Isaac, uh, was also a gardener with a keen interest in all things, including music, philosophy, and mathematics. And as Caroline said in her journal, My father was a great admirer of astronomy and had some knowledge of that science, for I remember his taking me on a clear frosty night into the street to make me acquainted with several of the most beautiful constellations after we had been gazing at a comet which was then visible. And when I remember with that what delight he used to assist my brother William in his various contrivances in the pursuit of his philosophical studies. So, yeah, maybe, maybe the dad said some weird things about his daughter's appearance. But, but I think at the end. The stars and shit. Yeah, take out and see the stars. That's awesome. You know, so uh, <laughs> I guess you can't give women too much confidence during this no, time. you got to oh, take a, not, make not sure they good. stay down just a little bit of a peg, but still love them and try and teach them things. Yeah. You know. Yeah. Uh, so that was kind of Caroline's mindset. And then at the age of 14, uh, William now became a professional oboist. Oh! He was a musician pretty early oh, on as a child labor. Boy. This one was like long horn kind of things, right? But skinny looks like a flute, but thicker. Yeah, and... something like that. Oh, okay, yeah. It's a yeah, woodwind yeah. there, right? It's a woodwind. Yes, it's a woodwind. Yes, it's a indeed. wind of wood. You so, make wind so through you, the wood. It goes straight where a flute goes that way and a flute's made out of metal. I wonder why the go. difference in flute and uh, Liz has podcasts. just been m m miming the difference of <laughs> flute versus oboe. In any case, uh, so he's a professional musician and he joined his father and brother Jacob in the Army's regimental band. And this was a time when musicians accompanied armies into the field of battle. Can you imagine? Anyway, yeah, Jay Z's just imagine going oboist. in with the boys. <laughs> <laughs> Jay Z uh, was not expecting Jay Z. I don't know. <laughs> Uh, but at this point, we're very close to the Seven Years' War, which is like the First World War, basically. And so they saw action quite a bit. And so there's one time William and his brother Jacob found themselves huddled behind bushes in ditches as bullets literally flew over their heads. And they kept themselves entertained, or I guess sane, by uh, reciting the great orations of the day. Oh. So there's bullets going on <laughs> around them, and they're just talking speeches. Okay, yeah. You yeah. know, I like to give a good, you know... Uh, since we're coming up on President's or MLK Day, you know, a little Good I speech. have a dream every now and then just to myself, just to, you know, keep yourself sane. Keep myself sane. Yeah, while yeah. bullets fly overhead. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so, in any case, after a couple of battles, uh, he found himself uh, quickly either released from duty or technically a deserter. Well, he got pardoned later on. It's fine. Uh, so, in any case, uh, the young Herschel was now living in Yorkshire, England. Oh, Yorkshire. they have great pudding. Oh, Yorkshire! Yes! Enough to get the, the firm handshake from Paul Hollywood. Yes. And so what he was doing there as a young lad, he was copying music to make a living. And it was a huge improvement from the water-soaked tents and bogs they were used to in the army. Oh, um, as in fact, as Herschel wrote down, he said, We were able to live pretty comfortable in the winter. Oh, good! Good That's for you! The last time I'll do it. Good <laughs> I won't be able to hold it. I don't want you to be cold, darling. Yeah. All right. Uh, so the next five years, uh, William and Jacob pretty much just did that, uh, copying down music, uh, report, performing where they could. And there's a little story where William went to Italy to learn more about music, uh, but he found himself with no money. Oh. And so to get home, he played the harps and two horns simultaneously. Oh. Wow. Okay. As, wow. as like a street performer. I don't know. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> and along the same line, so we finally got back. Uh, to Yorkshire, and he heard of a competition for an organist for the church up in Halifax. And there's a competition of like eight people, I want to say. <laughs> that would and... be the organist for this church. <laughs> oh, it was a very, it was a very uh, high class okay. position, actually. Because right. yes, right. people come see you every single week. You're amongst the public. People, you know, you're seen. Okay. In that case. You get your 15 uh, minutes. Yeah. 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 But every Sunday. Uh, so um, 
he was going third in this competition, and the first he was played so brilliantly with such dexterity. People told William, "Don't even bother pl- trying. Go for the next competition later on. You're not going to win." Uh, but what he did, because the organ in this time, they didn't have the foot pedals that we have today, so there's no long bass to go with it. Uh, he took lead weights from his pockets, put them on the bass notes on their organ so he can have a tune behind it, and then just play it beautifully. Mm-hmm. So with that bit of industrious nature, he became the organist Halifax. Oh, cool. Yay. All right. <laughs> and then during this time, uh, William entertained himself with Robert Hooke's book on harmonics. Just kind of keep that in the back of your mind there. That was all about the creation of music with some science input on there. But Robert Hooke, harmonics, remember that. Harmonics. <laughs> Never remember. He's going to come back later. Fine. I figured yeah. that. I'll, t- I'll let you know. We'll, we'll do figured a second it was back. a foreshadowing. <laughs> Uh, so he only played 13 Sundays at Halifax because he learned a better job up in Bath. And to my Bath. understanding, Bath. And to my understanding, Bath at that point was like the Park City or the Scottsdale or the Jackson Hole of England. Oh yes, so, oh yes. Here, it was hoity, very hoity. ritzy. It was very, very ritzy. Very ritzy, hoity toity up in there. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and then in 1770, his brother Alexander joined him in Bath. Another important note. Yeah, I remember that. Okay. Yes. And that takes us to 1770. Did we talk about Herschel? Or we're talking about Herschel? No, it was Herschel. Okay. Uh, everything's Herschel. Um, there's, a, there's a reason why this is like 200 pages of notes. <laughs> yes. I know. It's just so much fun, though. Uh, so in 1770, um, Caroline didn't have much of a life back in Hanover after the father Isaac died. Oh. Uh, yeah. Mm. She was basically a housemaid and serving with her mother. Because I'm scarred after... with the pox. No one will yeah. love me. Honestly. Uh, <laughs> I remember at one point the father, I remember as if I were there. Uh, the were. father said, you you're probably not going to marry unless you're like really late in life and somebody just wants a companion. Ah, uh, oh. yeah. Well, you know. <laughs> it's before they had face uh, creams. Indeed. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so she was in Hanover and living a pretty terrible life with the mom. And that's when Alexander and William contrived a plan, what? a ruse, a cunning disguise. Do they know? Do they know me at this point? <laughs> Yes. Okay. <laughs> uh, there were some visits, and Caroline remembers William from much younger age, things like that. Um, and as Caroline said in her journal, William thought, I might become a useful singer for his winter concerts and oratorios. He advised my brother Jacob to give me some lessons by way of beginning, but that it, after a trial of two years, we should not find it answer our expectation, he would bring me back again. Basically, I can't sing for shit. Uh, so it turns out, Caroline became a fantastic singer. Oh, uh, God, it makes it sound like I can't sing. I can't, I can't read she, old timing. She doesn't have the best, um, what do you want to call it, self I get a self reflection of herself. Well, I wonder why, with my father <laughs> telling me I won't amount to anything yeah, but I a mean, lonely right? hag and die alone. <laughs> As a matter of fact, Caroline would later be offered a job as a singer to make her own way in life, and she said no so she can stay with William. Oh, well. <laughs> maybe I'll have to give a little ditty later on. We'll see. Hey. Ooh. We can do a little Celine Dion, maybe. <laughs> Uh, so they have a fantastic story about getting to Bath, but that's that's not for this episode. So let's go forward, 1773. So during the last couple of years, William is doing his music lessons, composing music. He's doing the organ for church. He's, you know, um, in front of concert halls, things like that. And during this time, though, he's stargazing through most of it, making little notes in his journals about this. Um, and he's doing this so often that his interest outgrew what his eyes could see. And sure, he rented a small telescope, but that did not get the job done. Uh, And so, as Caroline said again in her journals, It soon appeared that my brother was not contented with knowing what former observers had seen, for he had begun to contrive a telescope of 18 or 20 feet long, I believe after Horgan's description. So, (laughs) goes from just looking at his eyes to thinking, I can just build a telescope, guys. I mean, why not? Galileo did it. He yeah, did, was the well, first one. Kind of. Well, I mean, no, it was the it was the Norwe- the uh, the uh, Antoine von Leeuwenhoek. Uh, yes, who did it? But then you know, Galileo was like, "Hey, let's take it to this guy, and then I can make this," you know. Mm-hmm. And then other people made one, so why not? Sorry, was Leeuwenhoek the telescope or the microscope? No, 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 no. it was va- it was a va- it was a uh, it was a. Uh, God, I, I, it was a, it was a. Yeah, it's a trivia question. What this is, is it? like right there, Jack. 
Yeah. Anyway, let's think about this later. Ah, uh, all right. Franz Lipperhey. Lipper, yeah. 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 <laughs> there we go. We got there. Our collective astronomy knowledge. Never. Right. So as, as we're looking at the sky, trying to build a telescope, um, turns out Robert Hooke, he of uh, the Captain Harmonics, Captain Hook, yeah, he actually wrote about optics as well. Uh, so it dissected lenses and mirrors. And so William immediately turned the entire house into workshops. Each room had an instrument of science or a workshop to create to, or to improve the instrument of it. And pretty quick, um, Herschel gave up the pursuit of refractors, which are lenses. So it's just like eyeglasses, basically. And it's because those lenses create aberrations in the stars, causing distortions in color. It's just tough to get a good view out of it. Chromatic aberration. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so instead, Herschel began working with reflecting telescopes and mirrors. How do they work? They were light buckets. Uh, so William had little success, but desperately wanted more. And as luck would have it, literally down the road he was living on, a lens maker, a mirror maker, was retiring and selling off his equipment. And, and as William said, When I bought his apparatus, it was agreed that he should also show me the manner in which he had proceeded the, proceeded with grinding and polishing his mirrors and going to work with these tools I found no difficulty to do in a few days all what he could show me his knowledge in, indeed being very confined You're such a fast learner darling that's what I love about you <laughs> what a, what a dumbass and, and I love that <laughs> Right? I, I, I love that, you know, Herschel's getting this great education from this guy and his notes, he just gives it backhands. Indeed, being very confined. Wow. Don't get cocky. So, he... <laughs> <laughs> okay, right. Oh, <laughs> so he first began with a very small uh, two-foot focal length telescope, but quickly improved to five and a half foot focal length. Um, and he then, at that point, he just became absolutely manic about creating and polishing his mirrors. Um, as Caroline once again said, I saw almost every room turned into a workshop. <laughs> so they became so in He should so work for uh, UFA. He, he, he could work for UFA, you know, teach them a thing or two about making mirrors. Yeah, down, down beneath their uh, football, football stadium. stadium. Uh -huh. I, I'm <laughs> loving the dramatic interpretation. <laughs> we are here for dramatic oh, yes, theater. Herschel. What, uh, serious this is, dramatic theater. This is no time for amateurs. <laughs> so they became so engrossed by creating these mirrors, grounding and polishing them, uh, that Caroline literally kept William alive during this time. Like, he would work for 16 Naturally, hours straight. Always right? the woman you have to, <laughs> this, you know. <laughs> <laughs> He'd work for at least 16 hours straight, and later on he claimed 30 hours multiple times, and he just can't move his hands at this time because he's busy with the mirrors. So Caroline fed him sandwiches. Like a, like a baby. Just like wow. hands him out. You are very lucky. <laughs> <laughs> I'm making drinks. <laughs> when I'm not making mirrors. <laughs> and even during this time, she became like the world's first audiobook uh, because she was reading books to him as he was still working. Uh, she mentions Don Quixote and Arabian Nights, for example. <laughs> I mean, wouldn't that be a distraction, though? Oh man, I messed up this mirror because I was it's so like, enthralled. It's just like it's so it's a, you, it, the, the, the futuristic people of today driving long distances listening to their, you know, casts of, of podular intent, uh, their, their audio speaking radios. I respect that. Okay. <laughs> so she was basically an employee at this time, but also the sister and caretaker. And as she said again in her notes... I became in time as useful a member of the workshop as a boy might be to his master in the first year of his apprenticeship. I undertook with pleasure what others might have thought a hardship, because I'm a good damn person. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> that last bit was also included in the Caroline's notes. <laughs> so it was through these efforts, thanks to Caroline and William, that they became the greatest telescope manufacturer in the world pretty quickly. Uh, the most common ones being the 7 and 10 foot focal light telescopes. And some of these you can still find today, like if you're in Chicago, the Adler Planetarium oh, actually has a William wow. Herschel telescope. Adler has one. That means, that means, that means who we know at Adler. I'm not going to say his name because, you know, uh, <laughs> he used to go check that shit out every day. Every day. Walks past it. Dude. That's cool. I know. That's cool. And oh, his, his I fame... would sneak in and try to touch it. Touch it? Oh, yeah. 
it, it was that, so the tubes are like ox, not oxcomital. Um, I forget the shape what it's called, uh, but it's made of mahogany wood, so it's quite heavy as well. Wow. Oh, jeez. And just and think, so, William and Carolyn Herschel touched that telescope. That's just that's they really put cool. their eyeballs to it. That's just crazy. Her there could be like still stuck in yeah, the I was just gonna say that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All right. Uh, and... Jack, Jack, I just want to point out, says uh, Arabian Nights has a nice rhythm to it, so we could see them using it to polish the mirrors and oh. lenses. So, you know, it's like it's like a little lo-fi in the background while you're working. Oh, that's very you know? nice. Caroline lo-fi. 17, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so they got, again, so into it that astronomers, court royals, uh, wealthy patrons of the purchases all over the world. And as William said in his own notes, I can now say that I absolutely have the best telescopes that were ever made. Fuck yeah. Now here's where I should have waited and said, don't get cocky, kid. Right? <laughs> okay, you can't do that every time. I can, and I will. So apparently, unlike Caroline, uh, William had no issue with self-esteem. No. He was all about himself. His father, was, I'm sure, was much more supportive of his future outlook in life. <laughs> Guy. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All right. So, so now we're going to fast forward to the year 1779. Uh, William is still, you know, composing music and doing I'm lessons. Sorry. Hold on. 17 to 79, everyone. Did I say 1879? No. Seven. No. Oh, 1779. Okay. Like America's just being born. Oh yeah. Okay. Like I'm just saying. Yeah. I'm just saying. Like look. That's yeah, the time. Years. Sometimes I just oh, I need this... some of those occasionally just to kind of center myself in time and just yeah. be like blown away by it. No, the things that happened during Caroline's lifetime were amazing. She wow. lived to a very old age, and we'll get to that later on, uh -huh. too. Mm -hmm. So at 1779, he's still composing music, giving lessons. In fact, he's so into astronomy while having to give lessons to, you know, make a living. Uh, sometimes he's giving lessons, the clouds clear up, and they'll suddenly stop lessons and go observe the sky as the students just kind of sitting there. As she should. Hell, hell yeah. <laughs> as she should. Why are the students sitting there? Students, get outside. Look at the sky. I know. Maybe that will. Maybe, you know what? That will inspire You guys music. don't know how good you have it without the light pollution. <laughs> so he was mostly distracted during his lessons, but still stopped after because you know, I guess he has a great mind like that. Uh, well, one of these days in 79, he was in the middle of a street uh, with his new seven-foot telescope observing As you are. the moon. As you do in the middle of As the street. As you do. <laughs> um, but then by pure coincidence, a fellow walked by and just asked to observe the moon. They got to talk in about the moon observations, and the guy that was a musician knew his astronomy. So the next day, this, this gentleman comes back and properly introduces himself as William Watson, a fellow of the Royal Society of London, hey. and got, got him to join the Astronomical Society of Bath. Um, so right, wow. so at that point then, William William knows his stuff. He has the best telescopes in the world, and now he's part of some Royal Societies, finally. Okay, he's got the networking going. It's got the networking. You think that'll happen to us if we took our telescope down to... A little sidewalk astronomy, Oakland? yeah. Maybe. Yeah, you become a royal member well, of the Well, sidewalk astronomy, <laughs> though. That, that was the guy that was in San Francisco and stuff. Yeah, there's the bar astronomy, sidewalk astronomy. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I'm just saying, you know, you get to know I did that. you get a little... Uh, I did that before when we had a, was it a eclipse for a transit? I took my telescope out and put the you know, sun filter on, mm -hmm, went mm -hmm. out to the park, and just people were sort of walking up and uh -huh, checking it out. Like, uh -huh. this is cool. Uh -huh. <laughs> So his notoriety is kind of rising. Uh, still has the best telescopes in the world. Fantastic musician, all that kind of stuff. You can, by the way, YouTube his music. It's it's it's, it's good. <laughs> it's good stuff. Okay. It's no Bach. It's no Mozart. <laughs> all right. I do. I wouldn't be able to tell the difference. Wow. <laughs> and that takes us to 1781. It's a cool <sighs> evening in March. Low 40 degrees. Uh, he's getting jacked on. Yes, indeed. William is looking through his six-inch mirror telescope. What he notices a small comet in the constellation of Taurus the Bull. Hey. What he notices it's slowly, slowly, slowly moving in the sky. Now, at this point, Caroline is actually back in the middle of town because uh, William bought a mill shop that went under. So she had to make sure yes, that right. they She's got the money when it's taking care of business. Yes. That's what I do. While his brother was just looking at the stars. <laughs> <laughs> So he's using a seven-foot telescope where he can see finer details where other telescopes could not. So he's one of the first people to actually notice some of these things. Um, and this particular star in stores had a haze to it. It wasn't quite a ball of light to be expected of a star. It could either be a nebula or a comet. But the test would be if that point of light would move with time. Mm -hmm. So four nights later, when the weather was getting clear, the Herschels 
and not, saw nobody objects move. It was a telltale sign of a comet. Hey. We discovered a comet. So more and more astronomers learned and observed this object themselves, but they realized it was far too large diameter to be a comet. And it described it as having neither beard nor tail. Hey. Interesting. So after considerable Ooh. observations, indeed, what's going on here? From many professional astronomers, it was determined this object was a planet. Hey. So it's long suspected that the solar system had may have other planets, uh, thanks to the immense gap between Mars and Jupiter, for example. There are theories of the distance between each planet goes in rhythm. There is a harmonics to it. So there's the asteroid belt, of course. And they thought, well, maybe there's one beyond Saturn as well. Indeed, there was. With what, what was the what was the law? There was a law. Yeah, there was a law. It, it's not it's a, like a scientific law because there's no evidence for it. But um, uh, as to why it would be true, but uh, there was a, uh, some dude came up with a law that yeah. the positioning of the planets um, included the asteroid belt uh, because the 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 law predicted something there, and it just happens that it's the asteroid belt. Mm -hmm, um, because Jupiter's gravity is preventing it from all co coalescing together. Yeah, yeah. But it, yeah. There was a, there was a law for it. I can't oh, remember. Okay. I, can't remember and I, I read his name, name in one of the two books I read about William Herschel for this, but I can't remember what it was called. So before we dive into the naming of this object, which is, of course has a famous story to it, uh, there's a quick little side quest because William quest. wasn't really big about discovering the planet. It's fine, whatever. And as a matter of fact, most people consider discovering this planet like low down on the Herschel's list of accomplishments. Really? Oh, yes. I mean, so, I so mean you get to did these... read all of the incredible other stuff. No, but a planet is, you know, oh. it's, you know, <laughs> one that you can't see just by looking at the sky with your eyeballs. Technically, though. Well, okay. <laughs> <laughs> so, yes, technically, uh, he was not the first person to observe exactly. this planet. Uh, but he was the first person to notice that A moves and has, pardon me, has and a slight has haste. no beard nor tail, therefore. Has no beard nor not tail. Not comet. So in order to reach these greater observations he wanted to, besides just the planets, uh, he had needed a bigger telescope. Uh, so while the rounds of the new planet were being cast around the world and they misspelled Herschel's name in every way imaginable across I mean, the newspapers. Of course they did. <laughs> <laughs> I had to double check uh, my spelling multiple times. <laughs> uh, William began casting a mirror uh, for a telescope 30 feet long. This was going to be absolutely massive. So that's and, a diameter? Oh, no, the uh, telescope is the, the, okay. the okay. Uh, the diameter, I think, was uh, 24 inches, which is huge for a curved mirror at this point in time. Yeah, it's that's going to be heavy. Oh, so they yeah. They the long focal length with this, 30 feet. Yeah, it's actually devised to be 537.9 pounds. Damn. <laughs> Very specific. Well, he took incredible notes. So to make a mirror of this weight and size, he went to different foundries with iron and different material to find the right composition and would constantly say that these foundries don't know what they're doing. Uh, so he did it himself in his own basement. Of course you did. Of course you did. Mm -hmm. Which... <laughs> now, as, as he's making this 537.9 pound metal mirror, um, something a little odd happens, and I think uh, William has it in his notes. Yeah, and before I read what I put in my notes um, a while back, mm -hmm. 250 years ago, I do want to point out that I thought all these other foundries were shit, and they couldn't do what they were doing. Yeah, of course do you did. Just couldn't do it. Of course you did. And that I could do it. Darling, you so ego much is the best. <laughs> because I am William. Glorious it's a healthy and natural. In, 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 <laughs> I am natural. William. I have found shit by looking through a telescope. Anyway. We perceived that some small quantity began to drop through the bottom of the furnace into the fire. The crack soon increased, and the metal came out so fast that it ran out of the ash hole. <laughs> I knew it, knew it. I knew it. <laughs> I'm sorry. Middle school William has come out. When it... I'm a proper lady. <laughs> So, where we left off is it's rushing out the ash hole. Mm -hmm. When it came upon the placement, the flags began to crack and blow up. So they caused an explosion out of the ash hole. <laughs> That's what she often said. <laughs> I'm going to drink to that, actually. That too, right? 
I like Arby's. As I like to say, I like Arby's too, we have the meats and you have the shits. Actually, that's what John Stewart says. I totally saw that from John Stewart. <laughs> uh, so in any case, well, going back credit. to the 1700s here. <laughs> what uh, do you so, know about John Stewart? Oh, John Stewart Mill. <laughs> oh, John Stewart Mill. Yeah. I've had a lot of time, darling, to see what the world's going on as a ghost. So I've been dead for a long time. What do you think? That, what entertainment do you have as a ghost other than to look at what's happening on Earth? <laughs> Not much else to do than catch the Daily Show. <laughs> That's fair. Well done. Well done. So in any case, this, this telescope is literally blowing up in their basement. The brothers have to run out of there to save their lives. The molten metal burned the flagstone in the basement. And today the house serves as the Herschel Museum of Astronomy, and the flagstone is still burnt in the basement. Oh, you could go see it? Yeah. Burn? And I just want to remind everybody, I thought the other foundries were shit. <laughs> Meanwhile, I burned the house down. Well, almost. you didn't burn the house down. You just... Oh, just learned some lessons. Yes. A lot of lessons. I, <laughs> I think we had health so, insurance. <laughs> so we were made in the year 1781. Yes. Um, and this is the same year, thanks to the discovery of the planet, that he was awarded the Copley Medal by the Royal Society. And the Copley I'm Medal is basically... Award. It's basically the Nobel Prize. It's the same thing, basically. I mean, that's cool. But does it come with a million dollars? Uh, well, they they made him a, a, a member of the society at no membership cost. Oh, hey. So that's there nice. Go. There's no subscription nice to that. Nice you don't so, have a membership fee. So, no. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, but, so, we, we have the fun about the name. Uh, Mike, what was your drink's name? Oh, the... Uh, Georgian Georg Star. Uh, yeah, the Georgian Star. The Georgian mm -hmm. Star. Mm -hmm. So, from what I can tell... Uh, People are writing the Herschel, asking about how to name things. Mm -hmm. He really doesn't care at this point, I think, about naming the star. I want to uh, give it your ego. You don't sorry, want it to planets. be called the Herschel planet. <laughs> the Herschel star. Well, you know. So I gotta, it was I gotta tone it down a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> so it was actually the Royal Society president, Sir Joseph Banks, that recommended naming new planet after the king, King yes, George III. Naturally. Now, in the past, at this point, it was just kind lost of... a war, but naturally. So, yeah, the whoa, French are going to this... love this. <laughs> well, the French have a whole thing. That's a, that's another story. Um, so, it was kind of popular at this time to dedicate a work of our or discovery after the monarch, and in turn, it was socially expected that the king and queen would honor them with another honor of you know monetary contribution fitting of the dedication mm. so it wasn't like a law but the king kind of had that obligation to yes. socially do that it's a whole planet what did the king give us <laughs> yes that was the thing because naming a planet after the king it's not like you're naming an opera after the no, king no it's a whole entire right. world like the earth yeah. but bigger Gassier. and fun fact naming an opera after the king is what uh william's other brother did and he got compensated for that so in any case uh, the king already had a royal astronomer, so that couldn't do. Um, so William instead was given a pension of 200 pounds per year to simply be available to the king and his guests when they felt like stargazing. Oh, on retainer astronomy Which, outreach. Yeah. Which has got to be like a billion dollars back in 1780. 200 pounds a year? Yeah. Was, um, so it wasn't as much as William was making, I don't think, oh. with the music and, and selling telescopes. But it did allow him to quit music altogether. Oh. And he doesn't write any music after this. Okay. Well, <laughs> and just apparently he's so far. Right so, now. okay. Not too bad. Not too shabby. Yeah. So <laughs> he was the official telescope maker of the king. So, he's better than being the jester. It's <laughs> true. So, you're a world famous telescope maker. Mm -hmm. You discover a planet. He's absolutely world famous. Um, so, they tried naming it the Georgian Star. But no one else really wanted that at all, so they quickly just called it Uranus after the father of Saturn. So that worked out. Mm -hmm. I'm very proud of us that we haven't made a Uranus ash oh. joke yet. Oh, it's simmering. Oh, it's but simmering. We, did, we did ash hole. It's real we simmering. <laughs> we had ash hole. But uh, just so you know, 200 pounds a year is equivalent to 15,448 pounds. Oh, today. that sucks. That's not that huh? much. That's not that much. Well, at, at least all. today. But but that's back then, so I guess it's Maybe? better. I, don't know. I I mean the house right. ho the housing then costs like six dollars per house. Right. So okay. So I mean, yeah, yeah you know, clearly 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 they were well off. They but, were fine. They were fine. They were not But this is just money you put in savings because you're just available to point shit out through a available. telescope. 
You're yeah. basically given a plan. This is an, job. Yeah, this is sub income. This is this is a secondary income, but <laughs> tri tritary, tri 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 whatever the. Yeah, happens. I got you. You got it. I would take yeah. that. I would completely take uh, that. Yeah, yeah. Oh yeah, hands yeah. down. If Oak Ridge would give us fifteen yeah. grand a year, yeah, just to be on retainer. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, basically. Like, like for like October to May, you don't even work because it's cloudy. <laughs> <laughs> Which kind of how it is in the UK as well. It's cloudy. Yeah, that's true. Dry. That's true. All right, so he has all this money now. Doesn't need to make music. Um, so he builds a bigger telescope, a twenty-foot telescope with a sixteen-inch mirror. Oh, 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 drink. oh, oh you heard that? There was a dog bark. There's definitely a dog bark. Oh, mm. that's mm. Leia. That's Leia. All right. <laughs> we probably have like a really massive elk in the backyard or something. I don't know. She was, no, there was a bird hanging out on her fence yesterday and she was just staring at it but didn't bark. All right. Anyway, All right. continue. Good uh, riddle. Thank you. Uh, so now we're in 1783, just two years after the discovery of the planet. Herschel's doing his thing, uh, discovering things, sweeping through the stars. Because <laughs> one of his primary objectives is to study the oh. distance to the stars and between the stars. Because no one knows how far away these things are. That's a fair point, yeah. yeah. And to do so at such great distances, uh, you need to find parallax in the stars. And this is where we have guest participation, listener participation. So, oh, if you're not, oh. so, if you're not, so if you're not driving, uh, stick out your hand, as, as arm length, and stick out your middle finger. <laughs> great. Now close one eye. Now open the other. Close the other. Open it. You see your finger moves about. Yes. That is from side to side. Side to side. To be fair, if you are driving, you still might need to do the middle finger thing. <laughs> it just right depends on what's going on around situation. you. Indeed. So that is parallax. That's moving distance to distance. And you can use that change in position to measure the distance between objects. So that's exactly what he's trying to do. Now, stars are too far away to properly have parallax. So what he's dedicated himself to is finding binary star systems out there. So two stars orbiting very close to each other. Okay. You have a thought there. Liz here. Uh, just, I just is amazing to me that, that people, uh, pre the technology that we have, could figure out binary stars and find them. Anyway, yeah. return. End, end reality. <laughs> Back in scene. Well, mine's are. Mizar yeah. is Alcor, Mizar? Yeah, but how no, do you no, know no, it's not a Alcor, Mizar. How do you know it's a binary? Oh well actually Mizar Mizar is you have two binaries, but you don't split the two different. Um uh, but but it still is two binaries. Yeah, but I'm just saying, like how do you know that they're gravitational, they're binary oh, during the seventeen hundreds with got you. you know what yeah. I'm saying? That they're bound together. Yeah, that they're bound yeah. together by grav you know, that's what I'm saying. Not well, that they're just too starting sure to look like they're close this is together. Where parallax will come in. Right. Yeah. Well, okay, just my brain doesn't uh, anyway. <laughs> and reality. So the, the key here will be when the Earth moves position onto the other side of the sun, uh, mm -hmm. that with the binary stars would maybe see some parallax. And based off of that, then you can be made to judge distances to stars, which has never been done before. Now, to do this, to discover these binary systems. Uh, Talk about system... a revolutionary time period. I'll drink to that. <laughs> You've been waiting the whole time. <laughs> Uh, so to do this, they invented the method of scanning the sky known as sweeps. Uh, this is how a considerable amount of astronomy is done today, uh, sweeping sections of the sky night after night, discerning differences and small peculiarities, just making large sweeps of the sky. No one had done that yet. They invented it. Huh. And during this time, as he is sweeping the sky with Caroline as well, um, he Thank was elected you. a member of the Royal Society. And he was given a copy of Charles Messier's Catalog of Nebulae and Star Cluster. That's cool. So this is the famous Messier object. So, for example, M42. A copy of it. I don't know. Um, I guess it just wasn't widely circulated. And they okay. go, oh, Here. you discovered the planet? I guess we'll throw you in this bone. <laughs> okay. Uh, but it was with this book and Sweeping the Sky that they really started the legacy. Like Discovering the planet was literally the tip of the iceberg here. And recently, they have moved into a new house, and Caroline kind of needed something to do. And as she's literally, that's what they said. And so in her notes, give the uh, woman something to do. 
Yes, Elizabeth. Oh, God, how dare and you. And in her notes, she says. <sighs> I found I was trained to, I was to be trained for assistant astronomer, but it was not till the last two months of the same year before I felt the least encouragement for spending the starlight nights on a grass plot covered with dew or hoar frost without a human being near enough to be within call. Oh, you sound a little bitter there. She she didn't have the best self-esteem. She's even like, I don't know if I can do this with somebody next to me. No, she did fine. She did absolutely fine. Because she I mean, discovers... I, I'm sorry, but I am relating a lot to Carol. <laughs> <laughs> Aside from my dad's disapproval, my healthy. dad is very supportive and loving and has never told me that I will end up alone like an old hag you because of not. all the pox that you, I've had. You but both put sandwiches in my mouth. No, no. I'm saying <laughs> just personally. Person- I'm related to Caroline, you know. <laughs> anyway, continue. Yes, so you, Caroline, uh, were show. uneasy with the idea of being left alone with the telescope, but she did fine, because within mean, the first few weeks, she I discovers two nebulae. I might break it as a Herschel or a Davison. Or as a Davison, that's right. <laughs> she discovers two nebulae not on the Messier list. Oh, look at yeah. that. One night with a telescope, <laughs> one night with a telescope, and I'm like, hey. Or multiple so, nights with a telescope, and I'm like, look what I found. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So already, she's one of the greatest astronomers if he stopped that. Cool, cool. <laughs> And then that same year, using his, again, 20-foot, 12-inch mirror at Windsor Castle this time, uh, William spotted another odd object that he described thusly. A curious nebula, or what else to call it, I do not know. It is of a shape somewhat oval, nearly circular. Yeah, so this odd shape appeared like a planet with a haze around it. Herschel then called it a... Planetary Nebulae! Planetary Nebula. Nebulae! <laughs> so he, of course, coins that term. Oh, shit, you coined that term, Planetary Nebula? I did. Fuck. I, I, you know, I did some creative writing and came up with that. Because <laughs> it looks like a planet, but it's not yeah, a planet. Right. You it's know it's a... not a planet. But yeah. it's kind of amorphous, and so it's like, oh, it's, yeah. it's nebulous. But I try yeah. to tell people that it has nothing to do with planets, but, you know, they don't ever listen to me. <laughs> well, you know... Yeah. He does. He's William Herschel. He knows everything. <laughs> <laughs> so night after night, the Herschels were discovering additional objects, not in Messier's Take cabinet. that, Messier! Yeah! The Herschels well, are in town now, they, well, yeah, Charles! Yeah, not, only, Shoot. not only did those Herschels find Fucking comments, French. Get the and, French and, out of here, Nebuli. Messier. Oh, man. Get oh, that Messier. French out of here. <laughs> well, here's the, thing, here's, the, well, here's the thing about Messier. He wasn't looking for nebulae. Um, he just really liked comets and wanted to find more of them. Comet and he, he would look through the sky. Get out of yeah. here. He would look through the sky, see these weird objects that's not a comet, and he writes it down so he's not distracted by it later and say, oh, what's this? Look at his notes. Oh, it's just an object. Whatever. What, what is on. he known for? All the objects. <laughs> All the objects. <laughs> so Mezzi's catalog had 100 objects. The Herschels would go on to discover 3,000 objects. Boom. Yeah, 3 Boom. fucking thousand. Chuck. Boom. Chuck, yeah, yeah, Chuck. <laughs> oh, now, during the... you, Chuck. <laughs> 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 Just throwing shade on Chuck. Uh, I've never heard Chuck Mazier, but I'm, I'm on board with that. Um, so the, during their initial discoveries, though, they were kind of shorthanded with cataloging. So a lot of people couldn't quite understand what was going on. So later in life, in her 80s... Yeah, in her 80s, yes. uh, Caroline would then go through these notes, classify them properly, and then William's son, John, would then submit them, and they became known as a new general catalog. So oh, NGC 1077, all of those basically are her that, that as, a, as an 80-year-old, I was involved with the new general catalog. <laughs> More southern. You got, you got southern down I got there, yeah. southern, but it you happens did. to old British women. They get southern. <laughs> Uh, which the NGC now has more than 3,000 things. So. Well, yes, yeah, because uh, time has happened. Adding. Time has happened, and telescopes have gotten better. They have. Yes, yes. and yeah. I've become but, more ghostly. And you are more British again, thank you. Yes. <laughs> but it, it did take a while, though, for telescopes to get better at their Herschel, but that's a that's different true. thing altogether. Uh, so, you know, as he's discovering all these objects, he's writing a number of papers, postulating on different ideas, things like that. So, for example, those fuzzy nebulae in the sky... 
he could sometimes convince himself he saw individual stars in them mm -hmm. and thought about the life cycle of stars and if maybe they were related. In fact, he says in his notes... In what I figuratively call the laboratories of the Laboratory, universe. darling. <laughs> Don't mansplain this to me. I will do what I want. In what I figuratively call the laboratory... <laughs> The laboratories? <laughs> laboratories of the fucking universe. <laughs> the stars forming these extraordinary nebulae by some decay or waste of nature may rush at last together and either in succession or by one general tremendous shock unite in a new body. The birth That's universe. really poetic, actually. And it's yeah. very beautiful. And, I mean, you know stellar evolution is... Uh, they just uh, wrote so well. Back then. I, because, oh, it's great. Yeah, uh, we've gotten dumber <laughs> in words as we've gone on. We, we, that's, we that's have right. gotten a lot dumber. It's dumber in words. We've gotten smarter. But, you know what? I think it's just in... like we don't have time for all this eloquence. You know, like, uh, we get it. All right. We're just down to the, <laughs> like, let's get to the point, you know. Hundred and what 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 is what? I is, mean, we're what back is... to hieroglyphics as it is right now with emojis. So. LOL, smiley face. <laughs> Yeah, well, we have to write everything, describe everything in 200 characters or less. Yes, yes. All right, so because I'm keeping this episode contained, are you? Moving on. Contained. It, I'm doing okay, actually. You're actually, okay. You're fine. Yeah, you're, you're actually fine. doing all right. Yeah. You're fine. We're going to move forward to 1785. Oh, my and God. We're still Wait, that is literally 200 years before I, Liz, am born. Nice. <laughs> okay, sorry. <laughs> okay. That was that was a sidebar. <laughs> All right, I'm not sure which of my notes I don't want to read because I say don't mention these a bunch. Uh, <laughs> All right, so oh oh oh, I need to I need to in post in post. I apparently need to edit your laboratories because it sounded a bit like labiatories. Oh, no, that's, that's a fun one. one. <laughs> I've heard that before. Oh no, keep that. Are <laughs> you like the labiatories? <laughs> All right, <laughs> labiatories so, of the universe. <laughs> the universe in is the run early... by women. Contain. Okay. In the early 20th century, uh, we have the great debate of whether the Milky Way is a galaxy, or if there are other galaxies out there, or we are all that is. That really started. Got some good bells out there. In this year, 1785, uh, when <laughs> William Herschel's having the same thoughts. Uh, in his minds. Is well, the Milky Way one of these nebulae I'm seeing? Are these small nebulae galaxies like our own? What's going on up there? So he wants to determine the shape, the size of the Milky Way galaxy. And in doing so, the ideas he puts in the paper, uh, this paper has been called the greatest paper in the history of astronomy. The greatest so law of, paper yes. in the history currently of astronomy. Up to that point, and I, I, you know, one of the more Okay, okay, up to that point. Up to that yeah. point. The greatest paper I mean, in the he, history he didn't of discover, He didn't discover, you know, the universe was expanding or anything like that. That's right, right. Because, yes, yes. <laughs> so, they were convinced that their new 20-foot telescope could spy the edges of the Milky Way galaxy. So, that would allow them okay. to give it a shape and understand the structure of the galaxy. All right. <laughs> and so, from their observations, uh, Herschel also assumed that the distribution of stars was more or less even in the sky, which is a pretty commonly held thought. Mm -hmm. And so with this information, they began yet another sweep to determine the structure of the galaxy. And the end result looks a bit like a bug splatter, if you've seen this image. Yes. Uh, mm -hmm. I absolutely love it. But uh, and they have the sun right clearly close to the center um, of this of globulous naturally. galaxy, but for a reason. So if you looked at that picture, there looks like a big mouth on the right-hand side of it, the big empty spot. Uh, that's the center of the galaxy. There's too much gas and stuff in there to see stars, see the inside of the galaxy. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, so mm -hmm. had he been able to see through the galaxy's core, uh, he actually would have had the Earth and the Sun basically in exactly the right spot. Wow, that's pretty good. Yeah. That's yeah. pretty good for 1785. Mm -hmm. 200 years before. 200 years before I was born into this world as Elizabeth Ann Davison, not as Carolyn. Who's Elizabeth? Herschel. <laughs> uh, yes, in the same I'm paper, he, he thinks about the Andromeda Nebula as well, and whether that is another galaxy. Okay, so they were talking about the Andromeda Nebula and at this time until Hubble, basically. Yeah. 
And, and Herschel, to be fair, was kind of kooky in, in some of his ideas that no. the people around him will say. No. Um, so I, I think I have mentioned this later, but he also really, I'm just going to skip to the sun really quick. Uh, the new, the lights, sorry, the sun and new lights. So he wanted to study the sun as well because he loved the idea of extraterrestrial beings on other planets. Uh, why would God create man and only put life on one planet? So clearly there's life strewn so throughout impressive. the galaxy, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> including the sun. So there's life forms on the sun. It's too hot. It's too hot. Well, no, 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 no. See, that's where you're wrong. See, only the outer atmosphere was hot. Uh, the inside was kind of kept, you know, nice and toasty inside. <laughs> and sunspots, by the way, sunspots are mountains poking the way through the atmosphere. I mean, that's a cool idea. I like that. I mean, you don't. Yeah. Uh, I mean, you don't know at that time. You can't. No. You don't have the technology yet to realize. You don't, oh, you it's don't just have colder. the physics to really understand it. So yeah. 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 Uh, yeah. So oh, really, like, in, in, it's yeah. putting forth a scientific idea. To like, uh, like, like. Never mind. I mean, and it could be. I don't know how it could be tested, but it could be tested. Oh my goodness! Yes, and so he thought there was life forms on the moon as well. In fact, many well, people call them lunatic. Well, there are. Yeah. <laughs> many people call them a lunatic. Oh. Quite funny, actually. <laughs> yes, and that's what they said. You are a lunatic. That's great. That's great. Uh, so, in any case, he was studying light to better understand the sun and the stars as well. Uh, so, what he did is he took a prism and had sunlight go through it. And, mm -hmm. like Newton, he saw the colors come out of the prism, the Roy G. Biv, yes. Mm -hmm. And so, he had the thought of measuring temperature of these different colors. And he noticed there's slight different temperatures throughout colors. And then he thought, what if I just move the thermometer a little bit off to the side, a little beyond the red? What you can see. And he saw the temperature... Indeed, went up. Oh, infrared. Yes, he discovered infrared lights just using that experiment. And that is pivotal in today. And in fact, we could not have the James Webb Space Telescope without the mirrors of, of William Herschel or the infrared of William Herschel. So it should really be called the Herschel Space Telescope. It sh definitely oh, should, it should, should, be, it should yeah. be called the Herschel Space Telescope. Yeah. Mm. All right. I, I am on board with that campaign. All right, so I'm actually five minutes short of an hour, which is very exciting for me. So I'm going to dive a little bit in to the 40-foot telescope. 40-foot telescope? 40-foot telescope. The original space mission, because it was severely over budget and severely behind schedule. Uh, let's but talk aren't about that. all of them? Yeah, that's why it's the original space mission. Okay. <laughs> so in order to build this massive thing, he needed 2,000 pounds from the king. That's money. Oh, okay. She has money. Yes. All right. I had to transition my brain over. <laughs> I know, right? Yeah. All right. You're back to um, Ireland. Now, yes, I know. All right. I'm back. Now, King go. George III at this point is getting more into his mad King George phase. Yes, because you know, he he's lost got the, the black war. eyeliner he's on. He's not in his right yeah. mind. He got he's, too cocky, if you will. Got too cocky. Kid. So, damn it. <laughs> So he has about 2,000 okay, pounds in money. Oh, I'm out. I don't want to water it. <laughs> the king says, no, you can't have this money. And William's like, are you sure? Because this would be the biggest telescope in the history of humanity. It would be a national icon. People will flock to this. Yes. And don't you want that to be under your kingdom? The king goes, it's a good idea. Yes, appeal to the ego, I always say. <laughs> mm -hmm. Always get the big telescopes. Now, he's about halfway done when he needs more money. And the king says, no. Um, but yeah. William goes, you already spent 2,000 pounds. Wouldn't it just be a fucking waste not to spend more money and have this magnificent telescope? So the king's like, fucking fine. Here's the money. Go away. And this is the last time I'm ever going to give you money. And after the king says that, William's like, well, you see about that is I also need some assistance. And I could either hire assistants and train them and pay it. Or you can just give Caroline a stipend here, a salary. Oh, yes, a pay me. pounds a year. <laughs> How much? 50 pounds. Oh, great. <laughs> that seems quite on brand for my judgment of the uh, day. $5,000 a year? Uh, yeah, it seems appropriate. <laughs> <laughs> but that actually makes Caroline the first woman to be paid for science. Oh, what? You've got to start that glass ceiling low, darling. <laughs> <laughs> you got to start it low. <laughs> So they finally finished the telescope with the help of Alexander, the brother. Um, and the telescope is just way too big. 
Like, he, in order to move it around, you had to jump down, you had to have assistance push things, there's pulleys and levels and wheels all around. It's just not worth the effort. So what William does, because he doesn't want to make the king mad, um, he'll discover things on his 12-foot, the 20-foot telescope, and then he'll run to the 40-foot, point it in the general direction, and go, look what I have found with this new telescope. All right. All right. That's very funny. There you go. Yeah. So don't don't make the this king mad. Really... Uh, I mean, that's a rule number one in all of European history. Is just don't make don't the make king, the king mad. mad. Yeah. It's like the emperor's new clothes feel yeah. to it to me. In the way. Yeah. No, don't make <laughs> trick the mad. queen. Trick yes. the king. It's always a trick. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, uh, but so wasn't gonna... there like the Earl of Ross who made a big friggin' telescope that also had like pulleys and stuff to move it around and probably. I mean the. 20, the 30 foot that he would sell, 20 foot had some pulleys and levers too. I think the Earl of Ross is called the Leviathan or something. Like oh, that. that's right. Yes, 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 yes. That, that's right. That is a massively long telescope. Yeah. And it's its diameter is smaller than what Herschel was making, but I do recall that. Yeah. All right. So we're going to try to wrap this up. Um, <laughs> if I'm allowed to in the hangover, I can talk for another hour about the Herschels. Um, but we did not even mention the amount of moons they discovered, the moons around Uranus, Saturn, that they discovered. Herschel even coined the term asteroid, if you're curious. I mean, it seems that, you know, you have the eye for the booty. <laughs> okay. <laughs> uh, did the big telescope work? Kind of. Uh, it it kind of worked, but no one could really see things besides Herschel because he was really good at it. So they just kind of... After he died, uh, his son, John, just deconstructed it. Like, no, sorry, not worth the effort. Cool. I also want to point out again, because I think it was glossed over, that he coined the term asteroid, which I think is fantastic. Uh, that was glossed over. As I said, <laughs> he likes the booty. <laughs> and that was about finding uh, the planet Ceres, which was called a planet for a good long while. But we can talk about that later. The dwarf planet. It had a fate similar to the Pluto I've heard about in modern days. Well, this was after it was called an asteroid then. It was called a dwarf planet indeed. And then in his 50s, so he had been you know, looking at Skype for about 20 years now, uh, he married and he had a son, John Herschel. And John Herschel, in his own right, was a famous scientist and astronomer. Big contributor to photochemistry and the camera. In fact, he coined the term photography. Oh, shit. <laughs> oh. So this family is just like getting shit done. I always forget that we are not married and we're brother and sister. <laughs> Like Duke and Leia. It, it was a slow progression of thought throughout the show that, wait a minute, <laughs> we're brother and sister. Yeah. Cool. I love you differently now. <laughs> <laughs> now, oh, when are William really Herschel... Weird right now. <laughs> <laughs> so, when William Herschel finally died, Caroline figured she was going to die the same year. Oh! I, what's the point? Without you my dear well William, I'm married, just going to die. Because <laughs> apparently my entire existence is tied to you. <laughs> And actually, when uh, William married, that uh, William and Caroline's relationship kind of got strained. For some reason, apparently, when you bring another woman into a relationship, in that case, it's that's not a sister. It gets weird. <laughs> uh oh. <laughs> <laughs> oh, poor uh, Kevin. Poor myself. But they, they, they eventually got, you know, became friends close again and everything worked out. Uh, so she thought she would die the same year as William. Uh, so she regret, she uh, went back to Germany to die. And she bought a very nice feather mattress for 30 pounds. Um, but she didn't die that year. Oh. She didn't die the next year either. Oh, shit. Um, she lived yeah. through the age of 97. <laughs> what? <Well. laughs> In fact, she only died when her son, John Herschel, uh, went down to the Southern Hemisphere, swept the skies, did maps, added objects, and thereby completing my father's work. So once Caroline heard that Williams Herschel's was... that William work has been done yes and then i decided i decreed oh, i can rest now i'm gonna yes. die now daddy's work is complete and i shall die alone meanwhile Basically. she was like very uh, much a part of that work oh absolutely like Papa so, predicted. Not just, even not just, even in her uh, it wasn't me it, i was just nothing <laughs> but an assistant but even even in her twilight years which you can make the argument that all the years of them were twilight because anyway um, that was she was constantly, a very long time. Right. She was actually sought after constantly from astronomers and royals wanting to hear stories and get her knowledge and things like that. And in, it was again in her 80s where she cataloged basically a, the general catalog with 1,800 objects. You know, 
I just shy, you know, I like to share the stories <laughs> and You only have one more bullet point. Okay. <laughs> Or your couple. So she was buried with the locket of William's hair by her own request and the almanac her father used. And okay. you, had, you had talked about this earlier, the lives they had. Uh, they they lived from the American Revolution through the rise and fall of Napoleon to the steam engines and trains to photography, even basically. That's Just it. the amount of change they had in their life. Wild. So I thought this was a fun line. So when they lived in the world of revolution, they revolutionized this guy themselves. Hey, <laughs> nice. Like it. So on her tomb, she has engraved that she wrote, uh, the gaze, I guess you should write this. You should read this one, oh, Liz. I'm oh, so sorry, you. Caroline. <laughs> Excuse me. Yes, I composed this for my tombstone. The gaze of the deceased here below was turned towards the starry heavens, her own discovery of comets, and her share in the immortal labors of her brother, William Herschel, will testify hereof to future generations. With that, join us on The Hangover up next. Follow us on all the things, and have yourself a wonderful day. Cheers, Stay everybody. Stay safe.